is the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. I'm Angela Madden. Welcome to Unscripted Faith. I have the great privilege and pleasure of being with Sydney Goldman today as Jay is off. Sid, we are so glad to have you on Unscripted Faith. Well, it is a joy to be joining all of you where you're watching from your living room or wherever you are. You know, it is such a joy always to join the Cornerstone Television family. So I'm so happy to be here today. And yes. Well, Sid, let's walk. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. We're really excited about this guest that we have today. He is a dear friend of Cornerstone Television Network's ministry and his name is Phil Cook. He is a media expert and he really has a good handle on of understanding when we see crises unfolding in our church. Mm. And so when we see right now in our culture and our society, yes. there's a lot of things that are unraveling, a lot of things that are popping up in the news. And so he's going to help give us wisdom and insight and revelation, how we can handle those things when they arise. We truly need this conversation in this hour. I'm in crisis to the right and to the left. <laughs> So our next guest is the co-founder and CEO of Cook Media Group in LA and the nonprofit organization, The Influence Lab. He's also a highly accomplished author and respected media expert with decades of experience in crisis management consulting for churches and ministries. In Phil Cook's new book, Church on Trial, he offers practical advice for protecting your congregation, mission, and reputation during a crisis. Phil, it's so good to have you join us on Unscripted Faith. Well, thank you, Angela and Sydney. It's a pleasure to be here. I love every opportunity to be with the Cornerstone family. That's a great bunch, I'm going to tell you. Yes, we're so honored to have you here today, Phil, and we can't wait to hop into more of your expertise. But you were sharing with us just recently you had a change in your life. Yes, yes. We moved from, after 35 years, we moved from Los Angeles to Nashville. Um, our, our daughter and her and son-in-law moved here a couple of years ago with our grandkids, and we decided maybe it's time in our life to follow the grandkids. And, you know, I'm a media producer. We've shot all over the world. So as long as I'm near an airport, I can do my work. So it's it's great. We're really having a, it's it's a mess. We've only been here two two or three weeks, but but uh, we're adapting and it's it's really a fun adventure. Well, I think it's so beautiful that you're closer to family. That's such a beautiful yeah. thing. And so we know family is near and dear to your heart. And even as we're segueing into our conversation about crisis management in the church, you have a very personal story and connection of how you dealt with it years and decades ago with your father. Can you share a little bit of your story? Sure. You know, I'm a, I'm a preacher's kid. I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. My dad was a pastor. And, um, you know, in the late 60s, when the charismatic renewal started happening, my dad started preaching about the Holy Spirit. And we were at a pretty, you know, denominational church. Uh, there was an elder in the on the elder board that really didn't like that direction. Even though the people loved it, the church was growing, he really didn't like it. And my dad realized it, but he didn't act. And he kind of put it off and put it off. But that, that elder was pretty, uh, he was a conniving fellow. And he worked for almost a year behind the scenes and eventually got my dad fired for preaching on the Holy Spirit. So, you know, I saw early on in my career that when a crisis starts, the best time to deal with it is right now at this very, very moment. Had my dad done that, he would have stayed at that church a long time. It's interesting that after my dad left, the church shrunk and shrunk and shrunk, finally closed, became a campus for another bigger church. But um, it was an early lesson that if we don't deal with what we see, you know, a red flag, uh, those early crisis moments, if we don't deal with them early, they can really fester and grow and terrible, terrible things can happen. So it was interesting that even though I've been a producer all these career, all these years, I learned that early as a young man about just dealing with it quickly and dealing with it effectively. It's wild how that moment unknowingly really prepared you for your future. Let me ask you, <laughs> Phil, if you could go back and, and you could talk to that, your father at that time, how would you tell him to confront that? Because it's very personal. I mean, I'm sure he had a relationship with this man. He was diving into things that were new. What would you tell him is the best way to confront it? How would he do it? Well, I'm a big advocate of transparency, and I would have made it public immediately. I mean, if there was an elder that disagreed, I know a great pastor in Texas that after all of his leadership meetings, he'll go around the room asking everyone individually, do you agree with what we've discussed today? Do, we, do you not agree? And if you don't agree, you have to talk it out right there. And if you do, he doesn't want to hear you, you know, talking behind the scenes later. So I think getting it out in the open, creating a, what I call a culture of transparency in your church is absolutely essential because... I'll tell you, this digital age we live in, you know, you can't hide anymore. And so getting things out in the open is absolutely critical. 
I just love what you're talking about, Phil, about that transparency, because I think a lot of times when it comes yeah. as Christians, we'd be like, everything's all right, everything's cool. And it's like, no, things are burning down, <laughs> things are falling apart. <laughs> and so it's so critical that we have transparency. And you brought up about, you know, we live in a digital world with social mm -hmm. media, all of those things are happening. So what would you say to, you know, the leaders that's watching right now, and there's something going down in their church, and then things become public? How do they navigate and deal with that? It's a great question, and I believe that pastors and ministry leaders need to be much more intentional about sitting down and talking to their team about these issues. Uh, we can't, you know, pastors just want to think, oh, that could never happen in my church. I'm going to tell you this, Sydney, that uh, it's not if a crisis will happen, it's when a crisis will happen. You know, in the world of social media, it's just too easy for somebody to say something inappropriate, do something inappropriate. And I, I even tell pastors, you drive out of the church office, you drive out into the street and somebody T-bones you in your car, you're going to get angry. You're going to get out of the car and get mad at that person. But somebody is probably going to be standing on the corner with their phone filming everything. So the truth is we have to live absolutely transparent lives or we're going to get into real trouble down the road. So I, I, I would encourage pastors to sit down with your team, talk about red flags, you know, things that we need to discuss with each other. Are there times when you see something you should go to a senior leader about? I think if we can create that transparent culture where everybody's much more open, I think it really will help a great, great deal. Now, Phil, I think about all the diversity of people who are within the churches and even their different yeah. beliefs, you know, th thinking about the example of you growing up and Holy Spirit and some seeing it that way and others not. How do leaders know when to address something in their church and when to just lay low? That's a, you know, that's a, that's almost an impossible question to answer, Angela, because it's like, uh, you know, you just never know until that moment comes. Sometimes it is better to lay low or stay quiet and let it go by. Now, here's the thing. We never want to lie about anything. We never want to cover anything up. We, ne you know, even if we think we're helping the situation, that we're protecting someone, uh, I'll tell you, I've learned over the years that anything you try to cover up will come back and bite you later. It's going to be a mess later on. So, you know, you don't have to tell the gory details. You don't have to always you know, just, you know, confess everything. But we do want to get, if we see a situation happening, we don't want to cover it up. We want to be absolutely honest, according to what we know at the time, be absolutely honest. I think that's the only real way of dealing with those issues is getting them out there in the public. In fact, if you look at a lot of the crisis situations that have happened in the church recently in the headlines, a big part of the criticism wasn't just the, the, the sin or the transgression or the abuse or whatever it was. A big part of the criticism is they were, they were slow to act. They were slow to communicate to the congregation. And when you do that, it really hurts your sense of trust with the people that you serve. So if you're going to build trust with your congregation, your donors, your supporters, you have to go public. You have to be transparent. You have to be open. Yeah, I just love that so much. Yes. Just being transparent, being open, yes. Angela, is so necessary because I think a lot of times we want to bypass that, but we, we have to. You have to. It's definitely the season that we're in. I totally agree. I love this. Such good wisdom. Listen, we're going to have more coming up with Phil, but first, let's take a moment to check in with Amy, who tackles a tough question about church and politics. Here's this week's Ask Amy. Welcome to this segment of Ask Amy, where you write in questions and we just look to God's word and to God's truth for the answers today. I'm really excited about this question. You know, growing up, we were told you do not mix politics and religion. As a matter of fact, I grew up watching Linus on the Peanuts say this, you never mix politics, religion, or the great pumpkin. Well, today we are going to address the elephant in the room. The question today is, should the church be involved in politics? Thank you for that question. I have a few thoughts and a few scriptures. Number one, is it actually political issue or is it biblical? I mean, when we're talking about life and borders and Israel and the economy and taxes, is that just a political issue or is it actually a biblical truth, biblical value? A lot of times politics, most of the time, they hijack biblical values and make them political. Number two, there are a couple of worldviews when we're thinking about the church and politics. There's the biblical worldview and there are the secular worldview. And when we're voting for people, when we have governors and, and mayors and officials in office, 
They are voting through their viewpoint. This is where they're gonna base their decisions and their actions on this particular worldview. So we've gotta take a look. If we're not looking at who's going to come with a biblical worldview, then it's opening up to secular humanism, Marxism, postmodernism, Islam. So worldviews are huge. And number three, there are seven mountains of influence. Now think about these seven mountains of social influence, religion, family, education, government, media, arts and entertainment, and business. What if the church stays out of the seven mountains? What happens if the church stays out of government? What if the church stays out of education? What if the church stays out of family? Then we have all chaos. There's no morals, there's no values, there's no biblical worldview. The church has to and must be involved in biblical truths, biblical values, which is, quote, political. So let's look at Proverbs 29 too. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. What about Acts 4 verses 27 and 28? It says this, for in this city, they're actually met and plotted together against your holy child and servant Jesus, whom you consecrated by anointing both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel to carry out all that your hand and your will and your purpose had predestined should occur. You've got to reread that because it says that God used Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles and the Jews to accomplish and to carry out his purposes on the earth. What about Romans 19? For the scripture says, listen to this, to Pharaoh, say Pharaoh, I have raised you up for this very purpose of displaying my power in you so that my name may be proclaimed the whole world over. Wow, God wants to use people in government, men and women in government. Actually, the government executes righteousness on behalf of the church. The Bible is full of kings and priests working together to accomplish God's purposes here on earth. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute because it is wild. The men and women of faith are heroes in the scripture. Abraham was the leader of a nation. Moses was the giver of the law. David was a king after God's own heart. Joseph was second in command to Pharaoh and he saved the known world. Nehemiah was the king's assistant and rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. Esther went before the king, saving the annihilation of her people. Daniel is a government official under four kings, turning one king to the one true God. Paul worked for government. He saw government families turn to God, was a political prisoner, and wrote books of the Bible in prison. Jesus, his life story started with government and ended with government. So I wonder what the world would look like, what government would look like, what, what education, the seven mountains would look like if the church was not involved. So I say, absolutely, the church needs to be involved in what's happening in culture. And I'm Ask Amy, and I approve this message. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Amy, for that wisdom and insight. And you know, the election is just several weeks away. And I know it's a very contentious thing that's happening in our culture and our nation. But I love that we have, you know, the word of God to lead us and direct us of what's happening this season hour. And Phil, we want to get your take on this whole <laughs> issue. Yeah. You know? What are your thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. You know, what are your thoughts on the church politics? What's, what's, what, are you, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm pretty much on team Amy. I, I have to say that, uh, you know, years ago I would have said, you know, pretty much stay out, you know, let the pol political world do their thing. Let's preach the gospel. However, in the last number of years, 
politics is encroached on our territory. You know, when they start mandating things about marriage, about family, um, when they start mandating things about when and where we can practice our faith, when they start closing down churches because of, you know, medical things, um, they start encroaching on our territory. And I say at that point, it's time to push back. So, yeah, there, there are plenty of political things that we have no business messing with, you know, local ordinances and laws and things like that, 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 you know, vote, absolutely vote, get involved, run for office if you want to. But there's a lot of politics that really have nothing to do with the church specifically. However, Amy's right. When it does come to moral biblical issues, when the when they start encroaching on our territory, then I say it's time for us to push back and start taking a biblical stance and absolutely get in, get involved. Yeah, it's so important for us to get involved. And so, Angela, what are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that we really do need to be those who bring the gospel, who bring the light, who, who push into the darkness with his good news. Now, Phil, I know that in this management of crisis, okay, it, it's constant <laughs> chaos. Things are flying left and right. Yeah. And as leaders and honestly, as lay people, we can kind of get brushed to the side and, and really not be, con you know, the topic of debate. How do you recommend leaders keeping the people who are very much involved in the crisis because they're witnessing it or they're seeing it? How do you recommend pastors keep them at the forefront of it? And how do they minister through crisis? You know, it's interesting that one of the things the church has been extremely guilty of is protecting the leader and discounting or dismissing the victim. In many cases, when somebody brings a, you know, an accusation against a leader, whether it's a pastor or ministry leader, we want to circle the wagons. We know Brother Bob, and we want to stand with Brother Bob, and we believe in Brother Bob, and we totally dismiss the victim. But if you'll notice in the headlines recently, in a couple major church and ministry cases, where the leadership of the ministry or the church really circled the wagons around the pastor and protected him and discounted, even, even made fun of the victim. Mm -hmm. Only a matter of weeks or months later, they realized the victim was exactly right. Mm -hmm. And they were humiliated. They were embarrassed. In most cases, they were forced to step down. So it, in the early stages of crisis, we need to elevate. I'm a big believer that we need to deal with the victim well. We need to act, you know deal with both sides well. And uh, you never want to be caught dismissing somebody because we don't know, know all the facts. And um, so I don't care how much you love and believe in Brother Bob. And there are actually, you know, wrong accusations. There are, you know, you know, angry accusations that have no basis in reality. But we never know at the beginning. So take care of both sides. Offer counseling. Um, you know, reach out to them. I think that's really, really important. In the heat of the crisis, we need to be very fair and balanced to both sides until we start to really uncover the truth and know how to move forward. I think that, and, and, and something to remember, Amy, is that a sexual situation in a church is almost always an abuse situation. For instance, if a pastor or ministry leader has an affair with a with a staff member, that's an abusive situation because of the power dynamics. If that person is getting their salary based on their performance at that church and suddenly their boss or, you know, the pastor wants to have a sexual relationship, that's an abusive situation. The same with a church member. That church member probably really revers and, and looks at that pastor in a, in a very high spiritual way. And so that's abusive. So we need to call it for what it really is because these are terrible situations that damage the church. And, and when it comes to politics, nothing damages, I don't think anything damages the church more than us not handling a crisis well. In fact, in my book, I talk about one study indicates that 27% of people that leave the church for good, walk away from God entirely, do it because of a crisis in their church or how poorly their church handled a crisis. So this is really serious and we need to get a handle on how to ha handle this well if we're going to make an impact in the culture today. Yeah, I think it's really important. We got to handle it well because, you know, things are going to continue to unravel. You know, things yeah. are continue going to be shaken. And one thing, Phil, that I appreciate you also mentioned, too, is you being an expert that you've been in these situations that help manage organizations and churches. But you talk about the importance of getting the experts involved, getting, you know, a legal team, yeah. you know, having a you PR. Like, how yeah. important is that when it comes to when things are just falling apart and it's a hot mess? Well, the first call should always be to an attorney, no question about it, because there's, a, particularly if it's an abusive situation, because you have to, if a minor's involved, you're required now, completely required to report it to authorities. 
And uh, so that's a big, big issue and always have a, a, a good attorney on speed dial. I also think that having a communication expert standing by is really important as well, because it's uh, and this is important to, to, to share. It's not about covering things up again. It's not about, you know, you know, really trying to evade anything. It's about getting the real story out there. And we need to be able to communicate. There's so many communication issues when it comes to a crisis. Do we talk to reporters? Do we release a statement? How do we tell the congregation? You know, communicating through a crisis is, is incredibly important because you want to keep the trust of the congregation. Um, my goal is to help the church survive and get through to the other side. You know, if, if I don't think a church should collapse, and we see this happen quite often. Many churches have closed because of um, a, a stupid decision made by a leader, and um, someone goes to jail or, you know, a lot of, I'll tell you this, um, Sydney, this is important, is embezzlement is a bigger issue than we think. One study indicates that more than a billion dollars is annually embezzled from churches across the United States. I mean, think of what we could do for the kingdom of God with a billion dollars a year. So embezzlement is an issue. So all of these things, we have to handle them well if we're going to continue the, to win trust and keep the church moving forward. Yeah. I mean, I love that you're addressing these things and you've given us such a great tool for these leaders to be able to navigate crisis. Because what you said at the beginning, it is inevitable. You know, it's not a matter yeah, of it if, is. it is when. And so we thank you so much, Phil, for your wisdom. And we pray that blessings upon blessings in your new transition and all that you are doing. Thank you, guys. You're great. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity to be here and talk about this. It's a tough subject, but we do need to have these conversations. Yes, we definitely do. We definitely, definitely do. do. It's so important. It is. <laughs> Listen, don't go anywhere because when we come back, you're going to learn something about Sydney and myself that probably you never knew and will most likely surprise you. We'll be right back. We left the light on for you. Cornerstone Network is your home for Christian television. A place of rest, a beacon of truth, your source of encouragement and entertainment. Welcome home. you are enjoying this conversation that we just had with Phil Cook. What a powerful, powerful piece of wisdom, yeah. how to deal with crisis because it's coming. But Sydney, <laughs> you know, now I, I want to turn the table to you and to, yeah. and to me a little bit here, girl. Can you name a time that you just knew God prevented you from getting into trouble? Okay, so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna share this. It was when I'm a teenager, and so, um, and I will say this, I did get into trouble, but even how he stepped in and how he like changed my life around. Yes. So I remember that I was, I was dating this guy at this time. Oh, shoot. And um, I, uh, yeah, I like let him borrow my car. Anyway, logs, it was so stupid. I was 17 and I was out um, in the neighborhood. I was past curfew and I was speeding like on <laughs> this like road. And then the cops were behind, like the, there was, I saw a cop car behind me. Yes. I turned off my lights and went into the neighborhood, like drove into my like neighborhood of like yeah. Lido thing, and they pulled me over. It was a whole debacle, whole thing. And um, I was so embarrassed. Like I just couldn't believe it. And I remember my dad was there and they're like, we're gonna have to take you to court, all, all these different things. I say that all to say is that like, I feel like from that, like my dad, the discipline that he gave me, like we, mm -hmm. he let, I had to like stay in the house y'all during the summer for a really long time. But I mean, I was upset, and, like frustrated, but I yes. do see how like God's hand was even in my father because yes. as a teenager as being 17 and just right. going out and being with, you know, this guy and just different things, it was stopped. And so from yes. that point on of just having that time to be stuck in my room <laughs> yes. and really think and focus on the certain things, I do see how God really just started to change the direction yes. of my life and just some of the people that I was 
was hanging around and then you know I didn't have yes. to go to court it was fine <laughs> I actually the, the judge is like you know in the community I still see him to this day and so yeah I didn't have to go take all these classes and all these things so God's hand was on me because y'all I was I mean I turned off the lights y'all okay because the cops are following me okay criminal <laughs> oh yeah gosh, for real thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it's so funny yeah. though his hand of protection is so real yeah. Cindy there are so many times you know I used to I used to pray and maybe I still do sometimes when I'm in a hurry and I'd say oh Jesus blind the eyes of the police officers mm -hmm. let me get away down this road yeah. so fast but his protection is so real over our lives you know in fact I can remember a time I mean there are so many stories yeah. but I can remember a time when it was really crazy and, and I was running around late of course and um and was speeding and I got pulled over by a police officer and out of my mouth came the baby's sick now, honey, I, I wasn't married, didn't have no children, just straight up lied, okay? Yeah. I just, the baby's sick, I don't know. And, well, he said, well, go on, hurry up and get down the road. But I still had a citation. So I had to go to the courthouse, you know, before. I have never, this was in Ohio, and I have never been more intimidated and felt like I had a clearer understanding of a little bit of what the judgment seat of Christ must be like. Mm. When I went into that courthouse and this judge is real, real high up and I went in, my palms start sweating, instant tears are coming. Now, honey, all I did was violate a, a speeding ticket. You know, yeah. but I'm sitting here thinking I'm guilty. I'm, I'm real guilty. I ain't got a baby. Are they going to ask me about that? They're going to send me to jail. <laughs> Yeah, but literally, I ended up getting out with a, just the court fees or whatever, and I said, "I'm really sorry. I was just in a hurry." You know? But I think about that. I always use that example because it was a moment where I was guilty. I was wrong. The Lord gave me peace yeah. to get through it. He intervened on my behalf, even as silly as it was. But I feel like He shows up like that in big moments and those little moments. Yeah, it's so true. And just even when you're talking just reminds me of that, like Jesus is our advocate. You know, yes. there is a throne of God, that God is the judge, yes. but Jesus is the one that comes on our behalf. Yes. And he says, they're not guilty because of my blood. Come that on. is powerful. And I've yes. even heard of even, you know, stories and we're talking about, you know, Angela and I are talking about, you know, our personal stories of dealing with the court system. But I know there's many of you maybe have been in the court of law or something that's happened and you've literally seen the hand of God intervene. I've seen it with my own yes. family members where certain things they should have gotten a certain sentence or a certain situation, but yes. God stepped in and gave yes. them that chance. And so that's something that I think we have to be, you know, reminded of. It's because of the blood of Jesus. It's because yes. he stepped in for us, yes. that that's where our freedom lines and that we're able to live the lives that we have. But I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for his yeah. grace. <laughs> I really am. Honey, without his grace, where would we be? Mm -hmm. You know, I think about, Sydney, even you saying so many different scenarios and different people, their stories of his grace intercepting. Like, without his grace, there is no love, there is no joy, there is no peace, there is no hope. And I just, I think that we sometimes lose that, even in the midst of like the craziness of crisis, right? right. There's crisis breaking out in our church, just like Phil was talking about, or there's crisis with politics and, and the world as it is. We forget that his grace and his mercy triumphs all. Right. You know, I love the scripture that says his justice reaches to the skies, but his mercy to the heavens. And that's the hope that I sit in. Yeah, I just love like we're talking about our own personal crises that we're going yes. through. And maybe you are in the midst of a crisis. And we just want to offer our prayer line to you at 888-665-4483 because there's no crisis that's too big. There's no thing that is just God can't step in and yes. he can shift it. He can change it. But I think the most important thing, Angela, is he's changing our heart. Yes. To look more like him. Yes, his grace, his goodness, his mercy is for you today. And listen, you may not have the whole script. You may not see the beginning from the end, but he does. And he will walk with you through every storm and bring you out shining like the sun. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.